Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamancy. Tonight, Ukraine and Russia talk, but the fighting doesn't stop. From cities under attack to lineups at the borders, and from the Kremlin to the UN, the pressure intensifies. Also tonight, the courage of four children after a gunman killed their parents. The children's poise, their presence is simply outstanding. New federal COVID rules begin at the border, but you still need to test. We're obviously cautious, and they should trust us. And saying so long to Carol. Is this feeling that you're leaving starting to get real? A CBC legend signs off. This is The National. And let's begin with a look at Kyiv, where it is now Tuesday morning, and where more Russian troops are closing in. Five days after Russia's invasion, Kyiv is still in Ukraine's hands, but Russia has claimed other areas, and the fighting has left some communities in ruins. Here's a city just northwest of the capital, on its streets evidence of battles between Russian and Ukrainian forces. And minutes away, an ominous sight. Satellite images show a Russian military convoy, more than 60 kilometers long, heading towards Kyiv. So people there are bracing, but some may be hanging on to a sliver of hope after talks today between Russia and Ukraine that negotiations might eventually end the war. Margaret Evans shows us how the city is coping. Residents of the Ukrainian capital venturing out this morning after a two-day curfew, but only gingerly. Many spent those days in crowded emergency shelters like the underground. Now I feel very good because it's, uh, I finally see the sun. We are stuck in our flat uh, with a dog. Uh, I couldn't even uh, walk out with him. They emerge into a city whose face has already been altered, a grimace where once there was a smile. There are plumes of smoke and trenches being dug, long lines for supermarkets with empty shelves and the chaos of frightened people still trying to leave. Lives, too, of course, are being altered. This is Kiev's largest children's hospital, already running out of baby food. Shelling has forced the most fragile of patients to make a difficult move to the basement. Some are immunocompromised, receiving cancer treatment, like this woman's nine-year-old child. We receive all the medicine we need, she says, though we're running out of food. Russian and Ukrainian negotiators met for talks on the Ukrainian-Belarusian border, a stab at a ceasefire. But even as they met, the air raid sirens howled in Kiev. And Russia's brutal offensive carried on here and in other parts of the country. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, delivered a message to the Russian soldiers carrying it out. Drop your weapons and leave, he said. Don't believe your commanders, don't believe your propagandists, but simply save your lives. Leave. As for Ukraine's fight, people are still signing up to join the war effort, Max Karmazin included. I'm not really afraid. I believe uh, the world is on our side and, uh, you know, we were attacked. Kiev is back under curfew again tonight and there is more shelling. The talks today offered no promise of a ceasefire, but the two sides have reportedly at least agreed to meet again. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Kyiv. From Kyiv, let's head west to the city of Lviv, close to the border with Poland. And that's where Susan Ormiston is tonight. And Susan, you've been bringing us stories of people who have fled the country. And today, you saw firsthand what they go through to get out. Yes, for the last couple of days, we've been seeing refugees come into Poland. Today, we traveled across that border into Ukraine to verify what we've been hearing, that there's a big bottleneck on this side. Here's the first picture we saw just after passing through border control on the Ukrainian side. A group rushing through the last few moments of a journey they never thought they'd have to take. And then this young man, helped by his dad, it appeared. Families picking up, suddenly leaving everything behind. 
There's no question this exodus is exploding. Just look at the lineup. We mapped it, 18 kilometers, bumper to bumper. Cars idling, inching along. Some stuck in the line for five days, like Roma from Kyiv. So you sleep for 10 minutes, then you have to move the car forward. Da, da. Um, big car, uh, ga, uh, car, uh, stop. <laughs> 10, uh, 12 minutes. It's terrible. Catastrophe. At first, it was every person for themselves. But now the most vulnerable are loaded onto buses, women and children first. Others are dropped off at the far end of the line and they're walking in, maybe 20 kilometers. And along the way, volunteers are offering up soup or diapers, grandparents cradling babies, and the obvious evidence of a caravan of desperate Ukrainians which shows no signs of letting up. The UN upped its count again today. Now over a half a million Ukrainians have left this country, with 300,000 almost going into Poland. So Susan, clearly challenging to get out of the country. What about moving around inside Ukraine? Well, just before we entered the city of Lviv, we passed through several checkpoints with Ukrainian militia checking documents and cars. They're trying to keep insurgents out. It's not a nightly event to have an air raid siren, but there was one tonight. Our hotel evacuated. We went into a stone bunker in an old school across the street. And this all feeds into the uncertainty so many people are feeling here. And it's prompting some of them to head for that border. Susan Ormiston in Lviv, Ukraine, tonight. Thanks. All right. Nine Ukrainian civilians were killed today. That's according to the mayor of Kharkiv. And the UN says there have been at least 102 civilian deaths since the war began. David Common is here again tonight to show us where this conflict stands and where it's likely going. And David, what should we be looking for? Well, Ian, expect the Russian strategy to change. It'll be bigger, faster, and far more deadly and for Kyiv to be their focus. As of this morning, the Russians had control north of the capital, including the massive Hostomel airport. That's a place they can land troops. After slowly building up forces over the weekend, Russia now seems poised for a massive push south into the capital. And tonight, we are seeing the airstrikes that will likely only intensify. Earlier in the day, cluster bombs on Kharkiv, they dispersed dozens of smaller bombs, which means the targeting is indiscriminate. And to note, we are about to show some imagery that you will find disturbing. This is a war, and people are dying, and not just soldiers. It can be hard to verify images like these. I also want to show you something shared by Ukraine's Ministry of the Interior. A child, seemingly lifeless, on arrival at the hospital. CPR reportedly of no use to save them. And there are far worse scenes going on. Ukrainians continue to resist. Some there with guns, others with their voices. This crowd here yelling at the invading forces in that truck. We also told you about the 13 Ukrainian defenders on Snake Island who told a w Russian warship to go F themselves. Well, it turns out those Ukrainians aren't dead, but captured by the Russians. Meanwhile, north of Kyiv, more examples of how effective Ukrainian drone attacks are. This on a pair of Buk missile batteries. So what might we see next in a word intensification? The Institute for the Study of War says the South is where Russian successes are most likely to unhinge Ukrainian defenses. If the Russians can surround or overturn those defenses, then they could bolt for the capital. In the East and North, expect far more Russians on the move towards Kyiv, preceded by far more artillery, rocket and missile attacks. We are possibly heading towards urban warfare, shooting in close proximity, in built-up modern cities where people live. It was already a nightmare, but it could get much worse. All right, David Common, thank you. Thank you. 
The International Criminal Court is taking steps to open an investigation into what's happening in Ukraine. Today, a court prosecutor said there is a reasonable basis to believe that both alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity have been committed in Ukraine. The investigation, he said, will look at crimes by any party involved in the conflict. Today, Russia's assault on Ukraine drew more retaliation from Western countries. The Russian government and those who live in the country are taking painful financial hits. As Brian Stewart shows us, none of that seems to be deterring their leader. When President Putin spoke to some of his top officials, his fear over COVID kept them sitting a few meters apart. When it comes to the international community, he and Russia are much more isolated. He called the West an empire of lies, even as Russia buckles under layers of sanctions. On Monday, the ruble was in free fall, losing more than 30 percent of its value before rebounding slightly. To help soften the blow, Russia kept its stock exchange closed and hiked interest rates from 9.5 percent to 20 percent. Russian companies that export had to sell off 80 percent of their foreign currency revenues. And the long lines at ATMs continue. Our economic situation will get a lot worse. It's inevitable, this woman says. But it's still not comparable with the losses who are dying in their homes through the fault of our forces. And the economic pain is only part of it. Russia is increasingly sealed off. Dozens of countries, including Canada, have closed their airspace to Russian planes, and Russia has reciprocated, leading to widespread flight cancellations. Over the weekend, there were several anti-war protests across Russia. And today, some media sites were hacked to display this dissident message. In a few years, we will live like in North Korea. What is it for us to put Putin in textbooks? This is not our war. The problem is that the Russian public is extremely unhappy with their Master and Visa card not working, Apple Pay not working, uh, not being able to travel abroad. And that could just be the beginning of a new period of harsh isolation because President Putin isn't recoiling from the threat of new sanctions. In fact, the Ministry of Defense has confirmed that upon his orders, the nuclear missiles have now been put on alert. Briar Stewart, CBC News, near St. Petersburg. The United Nations held an emergency gathering today, the first of its kind in 40 years. Speakers from country after country conveying a message to Vladimir Putin, stop the fighting. Katie Simpson reports from Washington. On this world stage, Western allies told President Vladimir Putin he stands alone. The fighting in Ukraine must stop. Members of the United Nations General Assembly condemned Russia's aggression and denounced Putin's nuclear weapons threat. Take your finger away from the nuclear button and never put it back for as long as you live. In a tone of barely contained anger, Ukraine's ambassador compared Putin to Hitler. If he wants to kill himself, he doesn't need to use nuclear Arsenal. He has to do what the, same, what, what the guy in, in Berlin did in a bunker in May 1945. Russia's response was a familiar mix of lies and exaggerations, blaming Ukraine. Not long after, Russia's ambassador was informed that a dozen of his UN diplomats are being kicked out of the U.S. Support of Ukraine. Something the White House says has been months in the making. We are beginning the process of expelling 12 intelligence operatives from the Russian mission who had abused their privileges of residency in the United States by engaging in espionage activities. The Biden administration expanded its package of sanctions, now targeting Russia's central bank specifically taking aim at Putin's so-called rainy day fund, money set aside in anticipation of Western sanctions. Some assets within Russia's central bank are being frozen, a move made in coordination with allies, including Canada and the European Union. Ukraine's president wants additional aid and more, signing an urgent application to join the EU, arguing his country should skip the formal process, which can take years. Despite the circumstances, his push is unlikely to succeed. Other avenues of support will have to do for now. Katie, on top of his push for membership in the EU, President Zelensky now pleading with allies to consider a no-fly zone over Ukraine, but the White House is ruling that out. 
Yeah, Press Secretary Jen Psaki was asked about a no-fly zone during an interview, and she said, look, it would mean U.S. forces would be used to shoot down Russian aircraft, escalating this crisis even further. She said it is not something the president is interested in doing. We'll hear from Joe Biden directly tomorrow. It is the State of the Union address, and this conflict will hang over every word he has to say. Ian. All right. Katie, thank you. The Canadian government is taking more action in support of Ukraine. Ashley Burke looks at what the Prime Minister says Canada will send and why. Vote. The Prime Minister calls Ukraine's defence a heroic resistance and says Canada will be sending more arms to help. We will be supplying Ukraine with anti-tank weapons systems and upgraded ammunition. Of course, this is in addition to our three previous shipments. The new shipment is what Ukraine had requested. We need weapons to survive. Canada will send at least a hundred of these. Carl Gustafs. Their Swedish designed rocket launchers and 2,000 rockets as well, all from the Canadian Armed Forces' own inventory. We are coordinating with our NATO allies to ensure the safe passage of this aid. That safe passage will be through Poland. Up to 50 military members will help with airlifts to make sure aid gets where it's supposed to in Ukraine. Ukrainians themselves. A former Special Forces commander told like Power and Politics the new weapons could be absolutely lethal against Russia's armored vehicles. Once you get into cities and into built-up terrain, those small elements, those small paramilitary forces with the right equipment can very quickly bog them down and literally chew them up. Also today, harsh words about Russia's nuclear forces being on alert. Putin's use and language relating to nuclear capability is high, highly irresponsible. I condemn it in the strongest terms. At an emergency debate tonight, unity, but also more demands. Conservatives fully support the actions taken by the government of Canada thus far. But we are calling on the Liberals to do more. Canada's foreign affairs minister said that she's headed to the border of Poland and Ukraine tomorrow to assess the situation and make sure that this latest delivery of weapons can get across the border when it arrives. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Some international sports organizations are banning Russia from competitions. In a joint statement, the world's two most important soccer bodies said that all Russian teams shall be suspended from both FIFA and UEFA competitions until further notice. The International Ice Hockey Federation has suspended both Russia and Belarus and has withdrawn the 2023 World Junior Championship from Russia. Tonight we're going to take a closer look at the Ukrainian president as he leads his country's resistance to Russia. Volodymyr Zelensky went from comic to heroic leader. When have we last seen a president stand up in such a way and be in the trenches with his own people? Also tonight, chilling insight into how four kids survived the night a gunman went on a rampage in Nova Scotia. The children's poise, their presence is simply outstanding. And as Karoloff signs off from As It Happens, the CBC journalist reflects on a groundbreaking career and the trip that started it all. The plane I came in on was hijacked. We're back in two. Welcome back as we take another look at the scene in Kyiv. The capital city remains under Ukrainian control, but there are signs Russian troops have moved closer. We'll have more coverage ahead tonight, but we want to turn now to some news here at home. We have harrowing new details tonight out of the inquiry into the 2020 mass shooting in Nova Scotia. For the first time, we're hearing about the efforts to rescue four children caught up in the chaos. Two years later, the details are still distressing to hear. Kayla Hounsel explains what they endured. The first 911 call came from right here. I have to caution you that it's a disturbing, disturbing call. So disturbing, the public inquiry examining the shootings decided not to play the tapes. Instead, this commission lawyer explained how in those first terrible hours, Jamie Blair watched the gunman shoot her husband before hiding in their bedroom with her children, still on the phone with 911. You hear screaming sounds and the phone line disconnects. It's awful. Jamie Blair 
was shot at this time through the door of her bedroom, protecting her children. The children, aged 9 and 11, were right there, hiding behind the bed. Eventually, they smelled smoke and ran through a bike path to their neighbors. Their friends, 10 and 12, were also alone. Their mom, Lisa McCulley, also killed. The four children called 911. We've been doing this a long time. The children's poise, their presence, their capacity, their ability to engage with the call taker is simply outstanding. The children told the dispatcher the shooter's first name and that he was driving what looked like a police car. They hid in the basement, listening as gunshots went off around them. It shouldn't take two hours to go in and get four young kids. An older brother raised concerns to the Fifth Estate, but the documents released today show police returned to check on the kids multiple times. There were only three officers in the immediate area. People are bound to suggest that an officer should have stayed at the scene with the children, but with an active threat and only three officers deployed, is that realistic? The officers also used the code word pineapple, so the kids would know it was safe to come out. I guess it's not my place to say what I think about the kids, but... He noted they even expressed concern for officers and elderly members of their community, as terror literally reigned around them. Kayla, the details about what happened to those children were included in hundreds of pages of documents released by the inquiry. I know you've read through them. What else stood out to you? Well, Ian, there are a lot of really difficult details in these documents, but one of the things that's really evident is just how many people in those early hours told police the gunman was driving a car that looked exactly like a police car. Now, this has been a question since the very beginning about why the police waited until 10 o'clock the next morning to share that information with the public. Well, today the commission was asked if it has any better understanding of why the police did that. And Ian, the investigations director said, that's a topic for another day. All right, Kayla, thank you. Thank you. Several people were injured in Nanaimo, British Columbia after a huge explosion destroyed an empty house. The blast so powerful officials say it was heard and felt by people across the city last night. I looked at my brother and started crying because I was like, that was so loud, that was so scary. The truck was shaking, the ground was shaking, and then the power went out. Big rattle in the house, shook the windows and everything. This is what's left of the house. Police say it was vacant at the time, but it had been used as a rental. Two neighbors were taken to hospital with minor injuries from flying glass. Four others treated at the scene. Police are investigating, but they say it does appear to have been a gas leak. Some COVID updates now and news that multiple provinces are scaling back restrictions. Ontario set to lift most measures tomorrow, including mandatory proof of vaccination. While masks are still required in indoor public spaces, the Premier, Doug Ford, says that may change soon. Over the next few weeks, maybe after March break, when the kids get back, but we'll, we'll see. There's no secret. There's a per person I talk to likes these masks. No one likes them, but uh, I'm going to follow the advice. Saskatchewan scrapped its mandatory face mask requirement today. Alberta follows suit tomorrow when it lifts nearly all remaining restrictions. If you're planning a trip abroad, the journey home just got a little easier. As of today, fully vaccinated travelers no longer need those pricey PCR tests to return to Canada, but a different test is required. And as Sophia Harris explains, that is causing frustration. Last fall, Ontario snowbirds Diane and David Fine flew to the U.S. by helicopter and shipped their RV because the land border was closed. Now that it has reopened, they can drive home from Arizona, but they still face a hurdle, getting a pre-entry COVID-19 test. We have no idea what the lineups are going to be like trying to get the antigen test. Are they even be able to have enough of supply to supply all the snowbirds coming back? Starting Monday, travelers entering Canada can opt to take an antigen instead of a PCR test. Antigen tests are typically cheaper and easier to get, but critics argue it's time to scrap the test requirement for fully vaccinated travelers. We're obviously cautious and they should trust us 
So it just feels like it's over the top. On Friday, several border town mayors joined the debate, calling for Canada to drop all pre-entry testing for land border travelers, arguing it's hurting the already devastated tourism industry. Travelers are a lot like water. They're going to take the path of least resistance, and that may very well continue to include bypassing Canada. Several medical professionals also support dropping the pre-entry test. We're not really adding much, it's adding a lot of extra complication. You know, we're not going to be keeping Omicron out uh, or any other variant for that matter. But the federal government says the test stays in place for now as a precautionary measure. We must continue to exercise prudence. Let me be clear, our fight against the virus is not over. Ottawa says it may further ease travel rules if pandemic conditions continue to improve. That leaves the fines hopeful. The pre-entry tests will be dropped by the time they drive home next month. Sophia Harris, CBC News, Vancouver. Returning to Ukraine and the man determined to defend his country. Next, a closer look at the Ukrainian president. How Volodymyr Zelensky went from entertainer to wartime leader. And later, why the rising cost of living in this country could threaten how we care for our elders. Well, here's another look at Kyiv, where it is Tuesday morning, the Ukrainian capital bracing for attack after a day that started at the negotiation table. In a video statement tonight, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky accused Russia of intensifying shelling to try to force Ukraine to make concessions at today's talks. They ended without reaching any agreements. Zelensky has emerged as a heroic figure in this war, a self-proclaimed target for Russia who refuses to give up or give in. As Joanna Romiliota shows us, that's made him an inspiration for many Ukrainians following his lead. The day after a night of the worst fight in Kyiv has seen since World War II, Volodymyr Zelensky appeared on Twitter, tired yet smiling reassuring Ukrainians that he had not fled in fear. Fighting disinformation and shoring up a nation's courage. Zelensky, the comedian who became the president after playing one on TV, is not going anywhere, setting an example for others to do the same. I'm now in patrol. Everybody has Kalashnikov. Like many citizens, Denis Skarovsky has taken up arms. It's inspiring everybody to fight. We caught him on a break from patrolling a neighborhood in Kyiv. It didn't last I'm long. Sorry, I, I must have stopped. Bye. In this ever present danger, Ukraine's president could have been written off as an unlikely candidate for the hero role. Walty. Before taking office, he was better known for his comedic chops and even his dance moves. But his everyman appeal won him a landslide victory in 2019 as he vowed to negotiate a peace settlement with Russia. Natalia Konenko Friesen is the director of the Canadian Institute for Ukrainian Studies in Edmonton. He was an anti corruption president. He was a person who had promised to resolve the military conflict. He was Russian speaking Jewish entertainment guru from Eastern Ukraine. He had combined in himself the qualities of, uh, of a leader, but also uh, qualities of a citizen. Russia's pretext to denazify Ukraine is considered absurd given Zelensky is Jewish and lost most of his family in the Holocaust and has only added to global support, says Konenko Friesen. His current efforts and his current speeches are helping Western democracies to come united in the fight against the authoritarian, near-imperialistic expansion of Putin's regime. Zelensky has said he is Russia's number one target and his family the second. But he dismissed Washington's offer to get him out, saying he needed ammunition, not a ride. We're all very proud of him. This is the most asked question that... Christina I Corbin's TikTok video on why she and her daughter are also still in Ukraine has been viewed millions of times. Zelensky's courage helps, she says. I mean, obviously it's scary, but it definitely gives us a lot of hope for sure. And it makes us proud and it's like, it makes me proud that I'm here too, you know, and I'm not just like running from my home. Zelensky says he is determined to fight while keeping the door open to diplomacy. But while his fate is unclear, his legacy of loyalty is not. 
We are still here, he says in this video. His words, a promise to. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Back here at home, it is the end of an era on CBC Radio. Carol Off has signed off from As It Happens. Tonight, she and Adrian look back at a remarkable career. Hello, you. <laughs> Hello, you. Next, the legendary journalist reflects on her groundbreaking journey and the powerful interviews along the way. He's dying. She knows he's dying. And she wants him to, to know that he's loved. A complete stranger. The national interview with Carol Off right after the break. Welcome back. It is a bittersweet night here at CBC as we say goodbye to Carol Off. Tonight she hosted her final program after 16 years behind the mic at CBC Radio's As It Happens. Her decades-long career as a reporter and correspondent included many years here at The National. Adrian sat down with Carol on the eve of her retirement, fittingly, in a radio studio. Hello, you. <laughs> Hello, you. <laughs> Is this feeling that you're leaving starting to get real? I, I think I, you know, I'm trying to be really zen. But I'm on the verge of being um, transformed into a pile of wet Kleenex at this point. And so the, just don't touch me off on anything that makes me feel Well, like... I mean, what is it that makes you feel maybe sad? Oh, the people that I worked with, um, extraordinary people. Don't worry, Carol Off is not going to cry, or at least not right now. But it's probably coming. Hello again and welcome back. I'm Carol Off. How could it not? 25,000 interviews can change a person. And yes, she says she's counted. And at a program like the 54-year-old radio show As It Happens, there are the intimate, wrenching moments paired with the beautifully ridiculous. If you haven't laughed and cried, got angry, learned something, were surprised, all in the same show. If you haven't done that in 90 minutes, we've failed you. Laughter has always been an As It Happens hallmark. From Barbara Frum talking to the possibly tipsy owner of the world's largest cabbage. What did you feed the goddamn cabbage? <laughs> to Carol Off interviewing the man behind the infamous Bigfoot footage. The moment I saw her, I just said, oh my God, they really do exist. Because to see is to believe with me, you know. And wh why do you think it was female? Well, uh, the mammary glands. Oh, she had breasts. Okay. The whimsy, the studio, have grown on her. She calls herself an indoor cat now who started as an outdoor cat. I would argue that you're more than an outdoor cat. I think you're borderline feral. <laughs> and, and that's how I sort of mm. think of you is this kind of desire to, to be out there completely covered in dust somewhere. Mm. And I'm wondering, like, where does, where does that start? What was that bug that got in you? I, um, I, I think I got hooked when just traveling abroad. This is like the 80s, early 80s. And I said, okay, I'm going to go on my own. I'm going to just sell whatever I have and, and get whatever money I can. And I'm going to fly to Pakistan. And, and I'm going to meet Benazir Bhutto and I'm going to interview her. Did so, you have any reason to believe any of that would actually happen? No, she was in jail at the time. Anyway, I arrived um, and realized right away that I'd made a serious mistake, that I was... I was way in over my head. The plane I came in on was hijacked. And I was the only reporter, one of the very but three reporters we were in the airport at the time. And we began to cover this live, not knowing what was going to happen next. Police were pushing us back with their guns and screaming. A few times I was grabbed by the arm and thrown back. And uh, we still persevered. And eventually, I mean, it re ended. Badly, the hijackers set off an explosion and people were killed. But I was, I, I, the immediacy of that, the being able to cover that, to be there, um, and I thought it was, it was tr transformative. So the good thing about being a broadcast is that, you know, oh, no. your life, we have receipts um, <laughs> for a life like yours. Carol, quickly, did you see the evacuation of the wounded? There was a cavalcade of ambulances running out of the area. One could see the people were lying on the tarmac, face down. Carol, this is so useful. We thank you so much. You're welcome, Barbara. And you talked about getting up close to one of the police vehicles and talking to, the, to one of the hijackers who was face down on the ground. 
Um, well, I climbed into the vehicle, actually, and um, wanted to know who he was and what he was doing. I had to find out what happened. Who, was, who were these people? When, when I look at your career, and I, I look at sort of Bosnia and, and the Gulf War and these in, enormous moments, it occurs to me that, to me, looking at it from my vantage point, of course Karolov was there, of course you were there, of course, of course a woman was there, but it wasn't always mm. the way. And I'm, I'm wondering what generations now who, th who see it as a given are missing. At the time in the 80s to have demand, to demand that women should play these roles was called a radical feminist agenda. It's hard to believe now. Um, there were very few women in the field. The CBC had a policy. Every news agency had a policy that women did not go into conflict zones or war zones. Well, why? Because uh, for two reasons. One it would be dangerous for them as being women just because they're women. See, why? You, you look surprised, right? Mm -hmm. But at the time, this was made sense to them. The other thing was is that, we, and I was told this explicitly, that we would endanger the people we were with. We would be men. And that was the, the, the rationale. And so, no, we weren't going to be allowed to go. The warlords controlled every aspect of daily life here before the Taliban. That, of course, changed. Carol off at the pointy end of creating that change. To see war cover at haunts, her experiences in places like Afghanistan forged part of her identity. So too skirmishes at the microphone. There was no Harper war on drugs. Right? I'm asking you a question. Did you support the mandatory minimum sentences for people for as few as six plants going to prison? I'm afraid I can't answer that question. Demanding accountability, a Carol off trademark. You had three days to find out if it was true or not, and you didn't. No, I don't do that. I do the interview. I don't do the rest of it. You do a lot of research. Do you yeah, not will think you that stop harping be? on that? Yes, I do a lot of research. What worries her is that Canada, where getting a straight answer is no sure thing. Access to information systems in Canada are notoriously slow and secretive. The numbers of times we were told by, by politicians that we, we would not never get another interview because we had challenged them. Everybody wants to get straight goods here. There is a feeling, all of us, journalists, the public, that we're not getting it. What Canada has experienced is connection. October 2014, the murder of Corporal Nathan Cirillo, who was standing guard at the National War Memorial. In the awful wake, Carol Off reached out to the woman who reached out to Cirillo in his dying moments. I spoke to him too, didn't I you? I did. I actually tried to speak to him the entire time. What did you say to him? I told him he was... Um, I told him he was loved. What instinct is that for somebody, you know, saying, are you okay? You know, what's going on? Are you, it's like, do you want me to call somebody? No, no, she's, he's dying. She knows he's dying. And she wants him to, to know that he's loved, a complete stranger. And I said, well, why? Why did you want him to know he was loved? She says, because I knew that's what his family would want him to hear as he died. In recent weeks, when we saw what happened at the cenotaph with the protesters in Ottawa, and to see that desecration, the numbers of people who contacted me to say all they could think about was Barbara Winters mm -hmm. holding this man's hand on those very steps. Just the embodiment of love and care for others, the, the recognition of that you are a citizen and everybody is, um, is somebody that is part of you. That observation is so very Karoloff. A voice, part of the fabric of Canadian conversations. Easy to just expect it to go on. If there is hesitation in you about leaving this jewel of a program, what is that hesitation? The, the hesitation would be that I have a family here and as it happens and they have been extraordinary and I, I don't know how to leave them, but I have to. Moving on. And you can hear her final show on the CBC Listen app. CBC News is focused on the rising cost of living. Tonight we look at how that could affect how we care for our elders. What we're starting to now feel is the tip of the iceberg. Next, what needs to be done to help ease families under financial pressure and their loved ones in long-term care. Welcome back. Three months ahead of a provincial election, Ontario Premier Doug Ford announced new legislation to improve conditions for gig workers. 
legislation that would make Ontario the first province in Canada to establish a minimum wage and other important rights for the digital platform workforce. The proposed Working for Workers Act would extend the new $15 an hour minimum wage to gig workers, so that includes Uber and Lyft drivers, among others, and allow them to keep tips. It would also require digital platform employers to be more transparent with pay and job performance ratings. From gig workers to professionals to pensioners, more than half of Canadians now say they can't keep up with the cost of living. This week, our special series, Priced Out, the Rising Cost of Everything, looks at what that means for families. And tonight, the crushing financial burden of long-term care. Allison Northcott looks at one family barely treading water. Fenya Ambeliotis and her mother, Tula, have spent countless hours at her father's side at the long-term care home he moved into in October. Just seeing him like that it was the worst part. Their worry about his cancer and dementia compounded by worries about the cost of his care. This was something out of the blue, over 2000 a month, and uh, adding to the other bills. Everything is going up, prices are up everywhere, um, and uh, I have my own financial situation, so I'm unable really to assist her. So being there is really where I pay my bill is the kind of financial pressure a growing number of Canadian families could face in the years ahead. As baby boomers grow older, costs to families and the public system to care for them will rise. What we're starting to now feel is the tip of the iceberg where there's smaller uh, family sizes. Those family sizes basically have to take on more responsibility because there are fewer of them. And most importantly, there's going to be many more Canadians who are going to be called on as um, unpaid caregivers. A recent report by the National Institute on Aging projects the public cost for long-term care will more than triple over the next three decades to more than $70 billion a year. And with prices for food, shelter and gas climbing now, many family caregivers are already stretched with more strain to come. Inflation is on the rise and that's something that will impact everybody including people that are taking care of their parents. Uh, their cost has been rising over the past decade. Some economists say easier access to financial assistance and tax incentives would help, while other experts say Canada also needs more resources to help people age at home rather than in costly nursing homes. What's lacking is that national uh, concerted viable plan for it that's really going to take us off this dangerous path. And help ease the anxiety families like the Ambiliotises have about their financial futures. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. And we'll continue to look into why you're paying more for just about everything. We're calling our special coverage Priced Out. Watch for that on all of our CBC News platforms. Next, a surprise gift of a lifetime for a woman from PEI. It's uh, amazing to know that I have a new liver inside me. The unexpected donor who stepped up right after the break. Hera Kempton had been waiting for a liver transplant for more than a year. The PEI woman suffers from an autoimmune disease that attacks her liver. So when her condition got worse, she decided to turn to social media for help finding a donor. And what happened next? Well, that's our moment. Knew I was on the transplant list, but I hadn't talked about the live donor part of it. I met Hara maybe 20 years ago. Out of the blue, I see these social media posts. I wasn't aware that she was considering the living liver donor program. Of course, no hesitation at all. My husband and I both signed up. I didn't tell her. It came as a complete shock to her the day that I told her that I was a match. Heather said she was nearby and wanted to. Um, uh, pop over for a minute and I was like sure no problem she pulled up I was outside hanging some Christmas lights she hesitated and then she said well I'm going to be your donor it was shocking and amazing and I hugged her knowing that your friend is you know in desperate need how could you not step up and, and be that person and help it being Heather someone I've known for years and now know even better and share a part with her um, it's been really amazing. 
It is such an amazing story. So Sear donated, I think it was 70% of her liver. It regenerates, and doctors say within 8 to 12 uh, weeks, is it, that she should have her full liver back in terms of it regenerating. This is big surgery, though, for both of them. And for uh, Kempton, uh, she's still in a lot of pain, taking 40 pills a day to uh, stave off rejection. That is The National for February the 28th. Good night.